Hey, I'm Phil Nicodemus. I'm research director with Urban Rivers. I'm here to talk with you guys about freshwater mussels. Welcome out here to the beautiful Wild Mile in the Chicago River. Uh, we are here on the Goose Island Canal. Uh, this is what makes Goose Island an island. And if you look around, you can kind of see some of the finer touches that we put on this place. Hundreds of years in the making, we've got this big steel vertical seawall. And this whole canal, this whole channel, was dug like a big box. That's to facilitate barge movement, barge traffic back in the day when those were the highways, when those were the railways. This was super important for making Chicago the city as it is today. However, for a lot of wildlife, for a lot of things that really rely on the same river system, this is the worst possible habitat for them. It's an anti-habitat. There's 10 feet of vertical seawall where plants generally have a hard time growing. Um, this is instead of a nice natural river bank, which has a good slope to it, which has floodplains and wetlands on the side. Um, we remove all that and say, no, the water has to behave. It has to go in this particular way, at this particular speed, at this particular height. This is something that is really hard to get around in urban environments. Once we build this stuff up, there is a lack of ability to kind of break it back down and rewild it or renatural it. So our solution here was to use these floating wetland platforms that we've got out here. These are things where in these tricky situations where we're not able to do a whole lot on land, we can do a whole lot of restoration work into the water. And this becomes important for one organism in particular, uh, freshwater uh, mussel. These are big time, big, really important organisms in river ecosystems. Uh, freshwater mussels are rocks with guts, as one of our friends likes to say a lot. Um, these are things that are just sitting at the bottom of the river they're pulling out water, they're filtering all their food out from that water, all the oxygen they need. They're not gonna move much in their entire lives. Um, geese don't like them, but we like them a whole lot. Um, so what these things essentially do is act as big filters and nutrient cyclers to help return those nutrients to the wider ecosystem. Um, so incredibly important. When we come in as humans to these areas, what we notice is that not only do you have these steel seawalls, but we also make that bottom that they burrow into really uncomfortable for them. Freshwater mussels are sensitive to pollution. Freshwater mussels also need specific things that they wanna dig into um, to keep them warm, to keep them safe, protected from predators, um, able to filter without exposing much of their bodies is where they wanna be. So. As this bottom over the years originally dug here to 18 feet deep, maybe the deepest point in the canal right now is about 8 feet. So that's 10 feet of fine organic muck that has stacked up over the years. Makes it very inhospitable for a lot of these freshwater mussels to do the things that they need to do. Part of what makes these freshwater mussels so sensitive to their environment um, is they've got very, very particular requirements for reproduction. Um, they are not going to move much in their entire lives. So they rely on the river and the river's current uh, to carry a lot of their uh, genetics to new spots in the river. Um, so essentially what happens is it, it, they get into a particular temperature range. Temperature is one of the few things that they can detect. They know when things are changing temperature. They know roughly it's going to fall into this range. And our uh, species of interest, our target species here is Pyganodon grandis, the giant floater, and they are going to receive that temperature input and they are going to decide around November-ish every year until about March or so. The water's cold enough so we're going to get doing our thing. The males will spit out sperm, it'll float downstream. Females using their siphons, using what they feed with, will suck the sperm in and they will internalize it and they can wait months actually to hold on to the sperm until the next cold snap comes around, at which point they will turn that into glochidia, which are small microscopic larval versions of these freshwater mussels. Uh, probably 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, you know, crazy amounts of these microscopic versions of themselves in just one mussel. And what the females of this species will do is when the time is right, they will release these glochidia, these tiny microscopic versions, 
into this goo and they will spit this out in the river. It'll be like this long snot trail just dragging behind them um, in the hopes that fish populations, generally fish, will swim into this goo and this will either coat their gills or it'll coat some soft part in their body. And then these little tiny clochidia are gonna start drawing blood off of the fish. So they're vampires for the first parts of their life cycle. Um, this requires very healthy fish populations. The fish develop a histamine response, um, so they can't be reattacked by these uh, muscles as easily. Um, so you need regular, new, fresh, healthy fish populations. Besides this benthic layer being really messed up, you also require this whole ecosystem to be functioning well so that there's enough fish coming by them so that they run into the goo and they perpetuate this cycle. Those babies will then pull off of the fish the blood and the nutrients they need until they grow large enough, at which point they'll fall off the fish where they are deposited is probably where they'll spend the rest of their lives depending on how currents may move them here and to and fro. Um, so once mussels get somewhere, that's probably where they're gonna stay for most of their lives. And you'll find just huge, massive, massive areas and rivers walking along, you don't see anything, and all of a sudden there's a hundred of them. That's not unusual for mussels. They don't do much moving, so they are up to the mercy of the river itself. So here we have our Pyganodon grandis, the giant floater the fanciest uh, muscle you'll ever see. Um, we get these, and this whole part of this process where we're uh, bringing the pregnant females, which is what we go out and do in the winter. We go find these females full of glochidia. Uh, DNR, the Illinois Department of Natural Resources, says we can take five of them per year. Uh, so we go out to different parts of the forest preserve system where more natural parts of the Chicago River that haven't been as influenced uh, by urbanization. We go there and we find healthy females there. Um, and then we take them over to the DuPage County Forest Preserve where they have the Urban Stream Research Center. These uh, folks have been partnering with us for more than a few years now. Um, they're great, knowledgeable people with a really cool facility if you ever want to go check them out. Um, but what they'll do is they'll uh, take our gravid female, they'll let her release the glochidia, They'll take that glochidia, they'll put some fish hosts in their tanks at their lab, they'll attach them to the fish hosts, they'll do that first part, let them drop off of the fish, then they'll grow them in these petri dishes and these uh, vials. It's like a real fancy science lab with a lot of stuff, bubbling water going on. Looks fantastic. So they raise them in there, they're giving them algal drips, diatom drips. So these are the small, microscopic pieces of particles, microscopic to macroscopic food particles that these things are sucking in. Diatoms, algae, that sort of stuff. So they give them a simulated version. They give them a formula, a muscle formula. They let that drip through until the muscles get to a size about a fingernail. It's hard to see with this one. You know, we're a good, you know, five fingers big now, but they'll give them to us about when they're the size of a fingernail. We, we receive them all we're making sure you know, out here, the water has been dramatically improved over the years as the Water Reclamation District in Chicago, as other organizations, as the city itself is cleaning this water up. Uh, the, the vulnerability of pollution has dropped a lot. The fish populations have rebounded. All this good stuff is happening in the Chicago River here. The one thing that is left is to create these natural, healthy pockets for these guys to dig into do their reproductive cycle, let fish come up close and swim through the goo, per, uh, propagate themselves and continue part of this healthy cycle. So over here, we have our best solution for that. Um, aside our floating wetland platforms, we have some uh, submerged baskets. We have baskets that are sitting just beneath the level of the river. Um, and these are going to be filled with sand. And this sand is this comfortable stuff that a lot of these native mussel species like to burrow into. Um, they're going to keep them protected throughout the river. They're going to keep minimum amount of their body exposed while still letting them siphon through everything and get all the oxygen, nutrients, food that they need. Um, and it's going to just keep them comfy and health healthy throughout the rest of the season. So um, these things add a lot of habitat diversity. Um, the pockets of sand are also helpful for a lot of benthic macroinvertebrates. Um, these mussels, when they start to clean this water out, are then going back and supporting everything else 
that you want to see in the rivers. So they're clarifying the water. Uh, plants on the bottom of the river are going to start growing up a little taller, a little higher. Um, they are in turn going to be filtering things themselves and adding oxygen to the water. You've got all these different bugs that are going to be attracted to that, just like when you put up a forest. Um, you're going to have different things come and ex explore the space and utilize for their own reproduction. So this is just a part of revitalizing this ecosystem. Um, you don't hear a lot about these things, but they're some of the most important things that uh, habit this river. And so it's very, very important to us to help them do their thing. We don't have to do much. Just let them be, let them chill, let them uh, suck things out, let them reproduce just like anybody wants to do in the city. We're just here to have a good time, so. To start with, uh, when we propagate the freshwater mussels, we will inoculate the fish with the larvae of freshwater mussels. They will go into one of our recirculating propagation systems, like this system here. This system currently has largemouth bass in it. Uh, they are not currently infested, but it works exactly how you see uh, this setup. Uh, we are then able to, as the mussels drop off the fish about two weeks later, uh, we were able to harvest the mussels out of these systems using a series of pipes and valves. Uh, we'll send them through a... Uh, we will send them through a series of pipes into this sieve. Once they're in this sieve, uh, we'll then run them through one of our sieve towers to divvy out any... We're collecting fish waste in here along with the mussels. So we get fish waste out, we collect the mussels, and then we'll get them into one of our primary rearing systems. That's where that feeder system comes in. Gotcha. So the mussels will drop off, and then we're said we collect them in that system. And then their first stop after that is going to be a feeder system. So right here we have an example of our feeder system. This is a flow through. So the way the system works is very simple. We have our large water basin. The water basin pumps water into the buckets above. In here, we also have concentrated algae. You like, you can see. Inside of there is just algae concentrate. And that's the, uh, the main food source for the pump. So we pump the algae concentrate and the water into this mixing bucket. And then once every hour, the contents of that algae and water will flow down into the beaker. So it will fill the beakers with fresh algae for the mussel. In each beaker, there's anywhere from, what would you say? A few hundred to up to a thousand mussels per beaker. And then eventually these beakers will overflow. As they overflow, it'll flow down, flow into the drain, and then out into the pour drain. Right? And so that's why we call it a flow through system. None of this water is recirculating. It's just in and out 24 hours a day. After the beaker system, eventually these muscles will get large enough that we just can't fit them in the beakers well enough. So then we'll move them over to our pan. So we can take a look at one of our pan sources. So the muscles will get large. That's what we want to see. And so we need to make their, their habitat, their areas that they're growing larger as well. So then we'll get them in a pan system. So you can see these are just standard I believe these started their life as oil pans. Uh, dog dishes. Dog dishes. And then you can see, if you want to get your camera in, you can see in each of these a number of small mussels. In many ways, it is a similar setup, but this is considered a recirculating system. So still, the algae concentrate. That will feed into the sump. The sump will then pump the algae-filled water into each of these pans, eventually drains back into the sump and keeps recirculating. And then, if the mussels have successfully grown enough in the pan system, in a recirculating system, that's when we get to our final step where we will take them outside and put them in one of our ponds for later. Guys, the mussels that are ready to go out into the ponds, 
These are measuring in right around uh, five millimeters or greater in size. The largest individuals that you see in there are about uh, 14 mils in size. In an ideal world, we get them up to 20 millimeters in size at least before we give them to you. Uh, you guys, because of how your setup is uh, with the actual baskets that you keep them in, we at times have given them to you a little bit smaller than that 20 millimeters in size, and that's because you don't have to worry about the uh, round gobies that we do have to worry about when we're stocking them. Hmm. But all 272 of these are going out. We have another about um, 200 still then in lab that we're going to take care of until they're up to uh, this size. And then we'll stock those guys out. But yeah, these are all the muscles that are going out today. That's amazing. We should have like just over a thousand that will be going out. Thousand, wow. So we already saw our primary rearing systems, our secondary rearing systems. This is essentially essentially a tertiary rearing system in that um, the muscles will be stocked into these baskets after they reach about five millimeters in size in our pan systems. These baskets are made up of a fish basket um, as well as a couple layers of mesh in the bottom. They'll have about two inches of sand added to the bottom for the muscles to burrow into. Um, and once they're at that five millimeters in size, we'll stock these baskets with the muscles in them out into our ponds. That provides them with a wild diet that's made up of much more than just the algae that we have in lab. It's made up of, you know, algae, yes, but bacteria, uh, zooplankton, phytoplankton, all sorts of different stuff that we aren't able to replicate in lab. And so because of all that, because of the diverse diet, and because it's just a naturally occurring diet, it takes uh, a lot less from us. It's a lot less work from us. And that diverse diet makes them grow significantly faster. So once we get them in here, we stock them in at that five millimeters in size. By the time they're coming out of these baskets, again, in an ideal world, they would be 20 millimeters in size, ready for release. That's when we give them to our partners or we go and release them out into uh, waterways around here. Welcome back to the Wild Mile, to our wonderful muscle bunkers here. Um, last you saw of us, we were getting the juveniles, bringing them from the river to the lab, rearing them in the lab, and then growing them to get a certain size before we could put them into the Wild Mile. So over these last couple of months, they've been out in little baskets in the middle of ponds in the uh, uh, Blackwell Forest Preserve over in DuPage County. Um, they're growing in that point from almost just barely above microscopic to something more like the size of maybe your pinky fingernail um, to the point where we are able to take them and put them into our baskets here. Um, that part of the life cycle is the most vulnerable for them. They have all kinds of parasites and they all have kind of all sorts of different organisms that are trying to use really young mussels for different parts of their own life cycles. Um, so these young mussels were able to be protected and sheltered from the outside world until they were able to get big and bad enough to survive on their own. And so now in these baskets that we've got down here, they're able to pull in all the oxygen they need, all the food they need. They get a comfortable place to settle into. They've got a screen overhead protecting them from hungry fish and things like that. So it's our opportunity to be able to have them in a nice condensed compact place where they can do their thing. They can still make contact with all the water and all the fish they need to reproduce, but are still protected um, and are down there doing their thing for us. And we have some more beautiful submerged sections here on the Wild Isle. Um, this is something that we um, are playing around with, and this has a very similar setup to some of the other baskets that we've put in before. Now, instead of it being a distinct single hanging rectangular basket, this is more recreating a different sort of benthic environment. And this is something that you might expect to find in more a side channel or a, a, a slow-moving slow creek that empties into a large river or something like that. It's a little smaller, it's a little more protected, uh, but there's a little more opportunity to directly add different habitat types. And in here, just like our other baskets, but especially in here, we're really interested um, in trying to hold submerged macrophytes, which are plants that are growing from the bottom of the river upwards towards the light instead of the traditional on land growing down and around. And so 
by creating a different kind of benthic layer, we're not only supporting uh, the aquatic macroinvertebrates that have a bunch of different uh, uh, habitat requirements, but we're also supporting the fish that like different benthic environments up in this area. Hopefully, provide some kind of protected place for submerged aquatics to establish their root systems in this kind of different, healthier benthic environment. Um, and those are going to be really, again, uh, just like the mussels do, knocking down sediment, adding oxygen, um, creating this nice virtual cycle that you would expect in a lot of rivers, but you can't get so much of it.